Now that we've talked about the structure of DNA and how cells divide through mitosis, we're going to get specifically into how DNA replicates. And if you remember back to our discussion of the cell cycle, DNA replicates during S phase specifically of interphase. And during this stage, the DNA is replicating so that after mitosis, each cell has a genetic, uh, identical genetic copy of the DNA. So the two cells are genetically identical. And in our last video, we concluded with talking about an introducing DNA replication. And to begin with, DNA replication is something we call semi-conservative. And what this means is that each um, original parent or template strand uh, is, uh, is produced so that um, in the two new copies of DNA, there's an original parent or original template strand and a newly synthesized strand. And so rather than having a conservative replication approach where we get one that's completely original and one that's completely new or half and half, we see that one strand of the DNA, because DNA is a double helix, two strands, one strand of the DNA is found in each uh, of the two new um, strands of DNA. DNA replication occurs in a five prime to three prime direction. Now this is important and will come into play more when we actually look at the steps of how DNA replication occurs, but it's important to remember that DNA replication occurs in this specific direction, five prime to three prime. It's initiated at many points in eukaryotic chromosomes. In prokaryotes, uh, the DNA is in a, eventually a circular loop of some sort, and so it only is, uh, is only initiated at one spot. In eukaryotes, the DNA replication can be started at many different points, and that helps to speed up the process of replication. We can say that the replication begins at the origin of replication, and let's take a closer look at this process of DNA replication. And so here we've got an original parent strand, or original template strand, here and here. And we have new building um, DNA strands um, that are shown in green right here and right here. And so what's happening first is the DNA is unwinding. And an enzyme called helicase helps to unwind the double helix and separates these two strands by breaking the hydrogen bonds. Remember back to DNA structure, we talked about how hydrogen bonds hold the two strands together. Helicase helps to break those. Now, a different molecule, a different enzyme called DNA polymerase, this is particularly DNA polymerase 3, links nucleotides together to form a new strand, and it uses the pre-existing strand as a template. So here is DNA polymerase, and it's moving along this strand here, it's moving in a 5 prime to 3 prime direction. If you follow this strand right here, you can see that this is a 5 prime. So it's starting from 5 prime and it's moving towards what's eventually going to become the 3 prime end. And it's adding new nucleotides and it's moving in that direction. Well, this is pretty easy on one of the strands and that's called a leading strand. The DNA polymerase is just able to continue along and add new nucleotides to the strand. And they're added at the three prime end, which is right here. It gets a little bit more difficult when we look at something called a lagging strand, and that's the opposite strand. Now, because DNA has to be added in a uh, five prime to three prime direction, and because this original template strand is in the opposite direction of the leading strand, the process is reversed. And so what happens and what we see happen is DNA polymerase has to add a section of nucleotides, and then it almost has to double back in order to add more. Because overall, the overall direction of replication is going this way, the direction that helicase is pointed, but the DNA polymerase is moving in the opposite direction because of its need to add new nucleotides in the 5 prime to 3 prime direction. Now we're going to draw this out in class, and we'll see this um, in a couple of different animations and whatnot. Uh, if you're not in my class, there are a number of really good animations that help to explain this, particularly from McGraw-Hill, that I would suggest taking a look at. So let's go ahead and take a look at the different steps uh, written out uh, for what's happening during DNA replication. The first step, as I said, is helicose, uh, helicase enzyme uncoils the DNA. And all it wasn't in the picture exactly that we saw, an RNase primer 
called RNA primase, adds a short sequence of RNA to both strands to act as a primer, kind of like an initiator in order to start the DNA replication. And that primer allows the DNA polymerase 3 to bind and start replication. So then DNA polymerase 3 go ahead and adds nucleotides to each template strand, moving in a 5 prime, 3 prime direction. And one way that it helps me to remember this is that new nucleotides are added at the 3 prime end. Now in order for those nucleotides to be bonded or connected to one another, there needs to be some sort of energy provided. And so molecules called nucleoside triphosphates, which are basically nucleotides that have two additional phosphates on them, they lose two of their phosphates, and in doing so, it provides the energy to build that growing chain of nucleotides. And so then one strand, a DNA strand, is replicated in a continuous manner in the same direction as the replication port, in the direction that the helicase is, is breaking apart and, and moving forward, breaking apart the DNA. And that's called the leading strand. The second strand is called the lagging strand, and it's replicated in fragments because it's moving in the opposite direction, because DNA polymerase has to move in the opposite direction of helicase. And we call this the lagging strand. And those fragments are specifically called Okazaki fragments, and they're named after the, the researcher who discovered them. As those molecules are added and bonded together, uh, DNA polymerase 1, different than DNA polymerase 3, removes the RNA primers and replaces them with DNA. And then lastly, DNA ligase on the lagging strand joins Okazaki fragments together to form a continuous strand. And so then what we have at the end is two strands um, of DNA, one that, uh, each that has an original parent template and then one new uh, strand of, uh, of new DNA. A couple other things that we want to look at in this video is uh, the first one is called a nucleosome. And this is a, a DNA that's coiled kind of into a bead shape, and it's coiled around a number of uh, units, uh, of protein units. And it's a basic unit of packaging DNA. Um, nucleosomes particularly help to regulate transcription. And so it consists specifically of DNA wound twice around a protein, and it's composed of eight histone proteins. Histone proteins are responsible for the first level of DNA packing in chromatin and then that will eventually go on to make chromosomes. Additionally, something that's kind of interesting about DNA is that there are a number of sections of DNA that aren't used in gene expression in order to make proteins. Uh, eukaryotic DNA specifically contains things that are called introns and ex exons, and those are sections of the DNA. You can see in our image here, uh, exons and introns. And so when that DNA gets copied into messenger RNA, and before it forms mature messenger RNA, it has both in exons and introns. Those introns are removed in order to make mature messenger RNA. So the only remaining section of DNA, or, or copied DNA, template DNA, is the exons. And it's, the exons are the sequence of DNA that's expressed and transcribed into RNA. Introns are sequence of DNA that are not expressed and transcribed into RNA. Now, there's some new research that says maybe some of this junk DNA, like introns, actually does play a role in the expressions of genes, and although maybe not expressing a particular, uh, or creating a particular protein, might influence the creation of proteins uh, depending on environmental factors or other things. And so we're not really sure about how this works, and there's probably going to have to be more, a lot more research in order to figure out uh, if introns are actually helping to determine traits and overall characteristics uh, of the proteins. A couple other things to look at is the difference between single copy and highly repetitive genes. There are a number of genes that are repeated numerous times uh, in the genome of, of different organisms. Um, and obviously, as we talked about, not all of the DNA, the base sequence, are actually translated into proteins. Those highly repetitive sequences are usually between about 5 and 300 bases, or 5 and 300 nucleotides. They can be repeated almost as many times as 10, uh, 10,000 times, excuse me, and they can consist of about 5 to 45 percent of the overall amount of, of DNA in a eukaryotic organism. They're not always translated. Single copied sequences, on the other hand, are translated, and it's actually a very small proportion of the eukaryotic DNA. And so to kind of recap DNA replication overall, um, I want to look at a couple of different key things that are important. It is a process of complementary base pairing. And so base pairs always match up in the same fashion as we talked about adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine. 
and an incorrect matching is going to result in some sort of mutation, which is rare, but it can happen. Uh, as DNA polymerase is adding new nucleotides to the new strands, it actually has kind of like a, a spell check or a proofreading function in which it double checks the nucleotides that are being added in order to hopefully ensure that they are the correct ones. Complementary base pairing allows DNA molecules to be identical. And so what that means is that the two strands that are produced from the original strand are going to be identical to the original strand. So you have two identical strands. And so what it, what it results in is the same base sequence. And this is really important, the same base sequence, because for those cells to be able to function as the original cells did, they need to have the exact same DNA. New strands are complementary to the templates and identical to the other template. And so to finish off this video, let's look at a couple of the different experiments and uh, uh, research that's been done um, involving DNA. And the first one that we're going to look at is the Hershey Chase experiment. And this helped to confirm that DNA is actually genetic material. Because it was originally thought, well, long ago it was thought that blood was actually what was responsible for inheritance, and then it was thought that proteins carry the information of inheritance. And so in the Hershey Chase experiment, they used bacteriophages to transfer DNA uh, into some bacterial cells. And they did this by testing, or they did this to test for the presence of that DNA. So here is a, an image to show um, what these look like. Here's uh, primarily built out of proteins and then has a, a capsule in order to... And so what this experiment entailed is uh, these bacteriophages were... were um, one of them was added uh, uh, phosphorus-labeled DNA and another was added um, sulfur-labeled protein. And by adding both of... by using these to add uh, the protein or, um, or the DNA to these um, Basically what they were able to do is after moving the cells into a centrifuge, um, there was no sulfur in the centrifuge cells. And after centrifuging the cells uh, with phosphorus DNA, the DNA remained. And so what they found and discovered was that the sulfur-labeled protein capsules showed no sulfur in cells. Um, so basically what that means is that the, the protein was not transferred to new cells, whereas the phosphorus-labeled DNA was found in, in new cells, and so that DNA was transferred, whereas the protein was not. And so that sh helped, uh, and that experiment showed that um, DNA is actually responsible for inheritance and proteins were not. The last thing that I'd like to discuss in this video is the production of, of human insulin. And this is a great example of how DNA is the same in all different species. Um, the individuals that are diabetic are unable to produce insulin. Um, not all diabetes types is caused by insulin deficiency. And insulin is a hormone that helps to regulate the metabolism of carbohydrates, sugars. And so insulin can actually be produced by genetically modified E. coli. So here's an image of insulin. Uh, the production of it, um, it can be produced by taking the gene for the production of insulin and transferring that to um, a, a bacteria species, specifically E. coli. And so then that, that cell, that, that bacteria, that E. coli cell, can produce uh, actually enough insulin that can be harvested, like that, you, that can be taken and collected. Um, and the gene for insulin production is the exact same in, in human cells, normal functioning human cells. And so that gene is taken and it's combined with the DNA and put into the E. coli using something called a plasmid. Uh, and then that E. coli produces the insulin. And that insulin can be collected and then given to individuals who are not able to produce insulin. The reason that all of this is actually quite fascinating and important is that DNA is universal. And what that means is that all living things um, on the planet have the same DNA. What makes organisms unique or different is the order or the sequence and the arrangement of that DNA and small differences can result in big changes or, or small changes um, but is all possible due to the universal genetic code. And So because of that we can transfer uh, genes from one species to another and we're starting to see this more and more um, as our technology uh, begins to improve. Um, and so that is our discussion of DNA replication. Um, please check and watch other animations uh, to help explain the, the steps to DNA replication.